choice to come here today. There's plenty of fresh air and beautiful sky outside, but there's a lot of fresh air in here as well. So thank you for making the choice uh, to come and be with us today. Um, so much I want to say. Um, whew, yesterday, Rob spent the entire day at uh, the Sturgeon Bay Middle School with uh, six or seven classes of students. And during those times, I got to sit in a little bit, and I was re-reminded uh, by Rob that the Constitution of the United States of America, when it was signed, at that time left out about 50% of the population, slaves, women, non-property owners, Native Americans. And there is still much more work to be done to form a more perfect union that includes everyone. The efforts, wisdom, and actions of courageous Americans that came before us and are with us now are voices that have and will shape a future that moves this Constitution further in the direction of perfection. Many of those Americans are in this room today, and there are also some out there sitting in the chairs. These uh, portraits are all a part of a mosaic of promise and commitment to further the experiment of democracy in a way that gives us all a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood in a society that is fair, just, tolerant, and peaceful. Our energetic, bright soul and one of the finest human beings I've met in a very long time, Rob Shetterly, graduated with a uh, degree in English literature from Harvard College. And at that time, he took a couple of drawing courses, which changed the direction of his life from the written word to the visual. And I'm so glad he did. Um, during this time, he's also been, he was also very active in the civil rights and anti-Vietnam War movement, and I believe won the Vietnam Veterans for Peace Award in Maine. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Well, they made an honorary member. They made you an honorary member. Yeah. That's very good. Um, Rob started out as a rather surrealist uh, painter and um, during this time that I think I'm not going to go through the whole story of how this all came about because it's written in the brochure, it's written on the wall, uh, but to suffice it to say Rob went from, um, changed his work completely uh, and taught himself portraiture uh, to further this cause. There are now in the works 129 portraits, having started with only one by Walt Whitman, which we are so fortunate to have today. Rob lives in Brooksville, Maine with his partner, Gail Page, who is also a painter. I found out yesterday that his website, americanswhotellthetruth.org, receives about a half a million hits a month. And on the back of the brochure that we have published for the exhibit is the website. I would strongly recommend that you spend an afternoon going through there. There's so much more there, uh, including more images of the portraits that aren't here. For those of you who are here for the first time and did not see the 40 portraits that we had in 2005, we brought out our notebook, which is on the end of this table, so you could see uh, the 40 who preceded these 35. Rob will be happy to sign books for you. We have them for sale today. And if you brought your own copies from 05, you're welcome to have him uh, sign them. He'll be sitting at the end of the table. Uh, before I conclude, I wanted to share with you, uh, we have one more exhibit-related event, which will happen on Thursday, October 9th. Oh, next week. Yep. Next Thursday. Um, at 10 o'clock, the doors will open for coffee and cookies. And then at 10.30, our wonderful friend and colleague, Virginia Maher, who is a, an art historian and wonderful friend to the museum, will be giving a talk on art as social commentary to talk about the long, very broad, and very uh, illustrious history of art that has been used for uh, for social commentary as well. So it'll be fun to go way back, I believe she said thousands of years. So uh, that's free and it's open to all of you. I hope you can come back on Thursday. As a shameless and uh, challenged fundraiser for the Miller Art Museum, um, I'm going to say that if 
this has been an afternoon that has been worthwhile to you, there's a tip jar by the front door. <laughs> <laughs> it's with uh, the donations and generosity of all the folks who support us that make really special events like this even possible. There are seven exhibit sponsors for us, uh, O.C. and Pat Bolt, Bill and Betty Parsons, Dr. George and Christy Roney, our new board president, um, Roberta Nauman, help me Deborah, um, let's see. Oh, the Raybrook Foundation, and the Margaret, or the Robert E. Hansen Family Foundation, and the Artist Guild, of the, or the Art Supply Store. Um, and I'll close with just a very short poem. It's called Citizen Patriot. Keep working. Where there is greed, work for restraint. Where there is ignorance, work for wisdom and patience. Where there is too much certainty, work to ask and ask again. Where there is violence, work to give love an opportunity. Where there is poverty, work for generosity. Where there is arrogance, work in modesty and humility. Where there is beauty and where there is truth, keep rejoicing. Rob, it's all yours. Thank you. Is this loud enough? Can you all hear me? Um, I want to thank everyone who's helped bring this portrait show here again, and, and uh, especially Bonnie and Deborah. And I think if uh, I, I could think that I might even have painted all these just as an excuse to get here to see them occasionally. <laughs> it's been so so much fun to spend the time that I have with uh, now twice with with uh, um, Deborah and Bonnie, and um, others here who I've seen before. I, I'm not going to stand behind this because it makes me feel like I have to say something probably uh, more professorial and serious um, or uh, more profound than I might. So I just stand out here and talk to you a little bit. And I hope that after I've talked a while that you will also um, ask some questions so that this will be something of a conversation. I think I'll tell you a little bit more about the origins of this show and about myself and how this happened. I, I really didn't want to paint these portraits. That was not um, who I thought I was or what I'd spent my life as an artist trying to, uh, a point that I was getting to. As Bonnie mentioned, I was uh, really a surrealist. And what, what that meant to me in terms of, I guess, you know, I, I was talking to some kids yesterday about um, the obligations of different people in society, you know, no matter what job you have. Uh, you have a kind of obligation to do your job well, and, and uh, because doing a job well, whether it's a, you know, an electrician or a lawyer or a plumber or a, you know, a homemaker, whatever it is, you know, it's doing it well is, carries an obligation with it. And I thought of my obligation as an artist that it was to tell stories, really, um, kind of opaque stories, um, mysterious, ambiguous stories about the motivations for the things we do. And I thought that trying to reach for some kind of truth that way in all of its complexity, and its really open-ended complexity, was what um, my responsibility was, and also, uh, probably more importantly, it was um, a great pleasure to me to, to you know, I, I took a great thrill in trying to get something right in how complicated, how dark and comic it might be at once. Um, and so I had, I had, you know, was living off of my art for quite a few years working like that, you know, I'm, um, and I felt pretty good about it. And then uh, after 9-11, when the uh, rhetoric from our government started to move us towards uh, an attack on Iraq, and I knew from just the research I was doing myself and from what I was learning from people I believed in and trusted that uh, what we were being told was not true. Um, I thought that I had to engage this moment in some other way. I just couldn't live with the feelings that I had. Um, and not, I mean, that's why, you know, an artist works, whether, whatever medium you're working in, you, you're trying to 
express something or, or at least discover what those things are that you feel by trying to make it visible either on, you know, in words or in images. And as, as a matter of fact, um, when I was talking to, in one of the classes yesterday, one of the, um, we were talking about why an artist, you, you know, what, what, why you make art. And this one uh, boy named Hans, who's a senior, uh, said, well, you have all these raw emotions that you have to do something with. And um, I was, when he said that, I hadn't actually thought of the rawness of what I felt at that time. It was, I mean, the one very raw thing was uh, the anger I felt um, that our country could be so misused and misled. Um, which I thought was a real betrayal of what it's supposed to be to live in a democracy and how we're supposed to behave in a democracy. And um, the other really raw emotion was just grief. You know, grief for uh, what this meant in terms of uh, the future of the country, grief for the betrayal of our own soldiers to betray their own idealism and patriotism and to use them in such a way, uh, grief for the people, grief for uh, the enormous number of victims there would be from policies like these. And um, another really raw thing was, was shame. I was terrifically ashamed of the country for its arrogance and belligerence. And I, I thought, you know, I've got to deal with this. I mean, I can't live with this uh, because of the... And I also felt, the, you know, a mixture of cynicism in there, which I suspect a lot of you feel about um, the political process. And I knew that if I just live with those feelings, those, the, the anger, the grief, the shame, the cynicism, without being to express it, to turn it into something uh, of some positive use, that actually I was just going to burn up. You know, I was, just, I was so angry. And I spent um, really a lot of time, several months, just kind of stomping around in my studio at home uh, on the coast of Maine, thinking, you know, what can I do? What can I do? And I knew that this shift was coming that was that my responsibility as a, as a citizen of the country was overwhelming my sense of my career as an artist, and that somehow I had to merge those two and use um, my art to express how I felt. And, but I didn't know how to do that. And um, actually, it, it all turned on one day just looking up at my own studio wall and seeing this quote from Walt Whitman that I had pinned up there years before and hadn't even noticed in a long time about how to live in the world. And I thought, that's it. I'll paint his portrait. I'll scratch his words into it. I will feel better. And that, you know, it's one of the first things you do as an artist is make yourself feel better. And I thought, I will feel better. And I did that. I went to the library. I, you know, found all these books about Whitman and read a biography so I would know uh, something about his coloring and his eyes and things and, um, and about him more deeply. And then I, um, you know, found some old pictures and found one with a hat and put them together and made this picture, scratched his words into it hung it up on the, right in the entryway of our house and thought, okay, that's it. I can go back to being my, you know, my surrealist self. And uh, two things happened, which changed that entirely. Um, a couple people came in the house, stood in front of the painting and burst into tears. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's that bad. You know, <laughs> I've had that happen before. I've done it myself in front of my own paintings um, uh, for good reason. And, um, but they, you know, what they expressed to me was that they were feeling this intense nostalgia for what they had thought this country was supposed to be about and where it was going and um, that it seemed lost. And I was, I was very impressed with that. And then a couple of days later, I was once again raging about uh, to Gail, whom Bonnie mentioned, who's a painter and a children's book writer and illustrator in a, in a very... Uh, beautiful soul uh, who doesn't like anger and stomping around and head banging and all that sort of stuff. Well, I was doing all that and she um, said to me, gee, why don't you paint a couple more portraits? You were a nicer guy there for a while. <laughs> and I, and I, I just looked at her, you know, I just, and it, it suddenly there was, there was this little epiphany. And I said, <coughs> excuse me, I said, you're right. I'm going to paint 50 portraits. I'm going to call them Americans who tell the truth and then I'm going to give the whole thing away. And I felt myself sort of lift right off the ground. I mean, uh, as artists, you know, we always think we're somehow um, at least semi-removed from the, uh, the normal commercial world. That we have this access to 
um, speaking from a place that a lot of people don't have um, the freedom to do uh, or feel that they have the freedom to do. And, uh, but it's not quite true. I mean, we, um, we live in a commercial world. We have to sell pictures to live or write poems or whatever we do. Or, and, um, uh, but all of a sudden when I said, uh, well, I'm going to give this away, um, I felt, wow, that means I can say anything I want to say. And um, of course, my family thought, well, that's going to be a little interesting. I mean, how are we going to live? And, um, and I said, don't worry. It'll take care of itself. And so now I don't sell paintings. I uh, stand up and talk about the paintings I'm, I'm making. And I, I get into a lot of schools all over the country and talk to a lot of kids. And it's been uh, really a marvelous experience. Uh, I, didn't, I had not been a student of, uh, in particular, of American history. Um, and so, I mean, I read a lot of novels. I read poetry. I listened to a lot of music. That was my... Um, what I used to sort of feed my muse. And so I knew I had a lot of work to do. I and mean, when I said I'd paint 50 portraits, I had no idea who those people would be. And um, it was just a number, it was a goal, you know, and I, I never thought I would actually paint 50 portraits. But anyway, it was, a, it was something to work towards. So immediately I had to st uh, start reading and um, talking and listening and, and uh, uh, studying, um, reading biographies, reading political speeches and interviews and all that kind of stuff, and then asking people, well, if you were going to set out to do what I'm say, claiming I'm going to do, uh, whom would you paint? And uh, that's led me to many, many people that I had never heard of, uh, both in the past and especially contemporary people whom our media does not tell us much about, the people who are doing some of the hardest and most noble work for us as a, as a culture and a society in terms of justice and equality today. So anyway, I started... Uh, I just started turning these things out. And um, with each one came these marvelous stories. I mean, if, if you had uh, asked me, you know, seven years ago, say I started this in January of 2002, you know, to tell you anything about Susan B. Anthony, I would have said, hmm, well, she looks sort of like Whistler's mother. <laughs> Something to do with women's rights. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, I knew that much. Um, but, you know, so then you start reading about the folks and what they did and the kind of courage they had, the persistence they had, uh, the idealism they had. I mean, there's a, it's interesting that often um, idealism gets sort of a, um, a bad rap as though it's ideological in some way and, and uh, um, immature to some extent in a world of, of compromise. Well, you know, idealism is what propels all of these people who I'm so honored to be surrounded with today. And um, it, um, you know, without that, I don't know if we'd have any of the rights and freedoms that we seem to cherish. The thing about the shame, though, uh, was really interesting. I, I think that was finally uh, the thing that really identified for me what it was I wanted to do because um, feeling ashamed, I finally realized I didn't have to feel ashamed. You know, there was no reason why just being an American should make me ashamed, you know, because of a few people who were misleading the country. Um, you know, I could surround myself with people like these who I felt intensely proud of and feel a whole lot better uh, about myself and all of us. Um, and the kind of uh, idealism that was trying to drive us to live up to our to our own promise as a country. Um, Bonnie mentioned um, about the Constitution, and I usually talk about the Constitution. What I'm going to do now is just tell you a few stories about a couple of these people and some of the things that I've learned, because in the process of doing this, um, it's been an enormous learning curve, not only learning about our history, but uh, learning about the issues and also being able to, then to connect them with some sense of why things happen the way they do. Um, Sojourner Truth is over there. Uh, I won't tell her whole story. It's marvelous. If you have, don't know a lot about her or haven't read a biography about her, I encourage you to do that. It's just an incredible story. You know, she was a slave. Her name was Isabel. She, uh, after slavery, I mean, she was a slave in New York. New York and New, and New Jersey still had slavery until 1827. And after she was freed and she went to uh, New York City to work, um, she heard voices. Um, angels and God, she thought, spoke to her 
and told her what to do with her life. And she heard this voice that said, your name shall be Sojourner. So she gave up Isabel, and she, the next day she left the house where she worked and started walking away, just walked away, because she knew she was supposed to be a sojourner. And then she heard another voice that said, your name shall be Sojourner Truth, and she ded dedicated the rest of her life to walking, talking, telling people what she thought the truth was. And, you know, before the Civil War, there were two really important truths for her. One was about the abolition of slavery. The other was um, women's rights. And so she's out in Ohio in 1850s, and she gives this talk. You know, she was illiterate all her life, and the only reason we know what she said is because people were so impressed with her, they would follow her around and write down um, you know, her speeches. A woman named Frances Gage wrote, wrote one of the biographies, and she spent a lot of her life following Sojourner around just so she could write down what she said. And Sojourner gives the quote that's in the speech in Ohio in a Grange Hall. Um, she says, as part of her speech, the quote that I put on her painting, now I hears talking about the Constitution and the rights of man, and I comes up and I takes hold of this Constitution, and it's mighty big, and I feels for my rights, but there ain't any there. And then I says, God, what ails this Constitution? And he says to me, Sojourner, there is a little weasel in it. Well, you know, what she's talking about is what, just what Bonnie said, that, um, you know, on the very moment when that Constitution was signed by Benjamin Franklin and George Washington and James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and all those people, great people, uh, when they signed it and didn't establish justice for everyone, you know, only did it in a limited way, mostly for rich white men. They didn't end slavery, freed blacks, Native Americans, women, <coughs> poor whites, didn't get their rights. They created the necessity of dissent. If these rights were then going to be given to people, they were going to have to be fought for, they were going to have to be taken, they were going to have to be demanded. That, in a sense, is the first great lesson, I think, of, of, of all these people and also of our own history, that uh, the things that we are so proud of in this country, you know, that, that are generated by our own great words, were not given to us by the same people who promised them. They were given to us by the people who fought for them. And that, that struggle, which had to be made because, you know, when she talks about the little weasel, what she's talking about there is the entitlement of people with wealth and power who would continue to have slaves, you know, continue to use their influence to shape a policy that, that privileges them rather than gives rights and freedoms to everyone that it promised to give them to. So they had to be fought for. You know, the end of slavery, civil rights, women's rights, workers' rights, end of child labor, environmental rights, you know, uh, gay rights, what have you. They're all battles because there's always that element of people with a certain kind of privilege and influence who would keep them to themselves, keep those rights more for themselves than for other people. The next big issue that seemed to me, you know, sort of jumped out at me was the issue that's the opposite of dissent was about consent. You know, we say that our government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. Well, that's why we have, you know, in all of its wisdom, freedom of the press. Because, <clears throat> you know, there will always, in any government, at any time, there will always be people, you know, with some power, who will try to use their power to mislead people about what they're actually going to do, you know, for them or in their name that they will uh, use fear, they will use propaganda, they will use super patriotism, they will use racism, they will use all these various forms of manipulation to try to get them to go along with policies that are really designed not for their benefit, but for the people with the power. And so that's why you have to have a free press. You can't have a democracy without a free press uh, because the press should not be aligned to anyone and in terms of, I mean, with any particular power. And, you know, in terms of obligations in a society, there's no more sacred obligation in a society than the journalist, the person who is trying to get the people the truth so that when they give their consent, in whatever form they give it in, especially by voting, that what they're doing is giving it on the basis of something's true, not on the basis of something they're being told is true by someone who is 
on not necessarily telling the truth. Um, this is a huge issue. This is why, I mean, probably there's no more important issue in our country today. This is why we don't have a free press in this country right now. When you have major media owned by um, interests, corporations, etc., who benefit one way or another from policies of the government, um, you know, we just can never trust that they're going to be telling us the truth. I mean, if you have NBC owned by General Electric and they're a major weapons contractor, you know, can you trust that when you're coming up to, you know, or you're on the verge of a war, that a media company owned by a company that profits or will profit from that war is going to be telling you everything you need to know about whether you should go to war or not. But all of our major media is owned like that and influenced like that. And this is, I, I, you know, in terms of what needs to change in this country so that we actually are able to approach handling the, the, the serious problems. And I mean, as we're sitting here today, we know all of us how serious all these problems are. Um, whether we're going to handle those or not, you can't do it unless you're being told the truth. I mean, one of the things about the, the title, which I mean, of, of the show, Americans Who Tell the Truth, some people look at it, including myself at times, and say, well, that's a little presumptuous. You know, who are you? You know, and uh, on, on the one hand, I agree with that. And on the other hand, I say, well, of course, this is extremely subjective. You know, this is one guy from a little town on the coast of Maine painting a bunch of pictures and saying, these are Americans who tell the truth. Well, um, something about that is, I mean, I'm not claiming to know anything about, you know, the great metaph metaphysical truth, you know whose finger was on the Big Bang or anything. Uh, what I'm thinking about is just our own truth. As we set out in our own constitution, our own declaration of independence, and how we try to live up to them. When we create, with the signing of our constitution, this gap between what we say as a country and then what we do as a country, you know, I'm saying what I'm interested in is, you know, who has fought the good fight to try to close that gap, to bring it, you know, make us walk our own talk. Uh, there, there, you know, I, I said sort of developed sort of a checklist of things that are necessary for the health of a democracy. You know, and of course, as, as I mentioned, you know, one is the necessity of dissent, the other is the, the, the free press and, and an honest consent. And then there are a whole host of other things. And I kind of want to talk to him a little bit through uh, by telling you a couple stories about uh, some of these people who are here and people. Um, two of whom were on the easels who, a few years ago, I had never heard of. And, but their lives and their stories uh, moved me enormously so that I went to meet them and so that I could paint their portraits. This woman, uh, Diane Wilson, 20 years ago, she was a, a high school graduate um, shrimp boat captain in Sea Drift, Texas. Sea Drift is uh, southeast of Houston on the Gulf of Mexico and she was married, had five kids and had wanted all of her life to be a, sh a shrimp boat captain. Her great-grandfather, father and her grandfather um, were all fishermen and as a little girl growing up that's what she wanted to do. And so she finally realized her dream. She got her boat, she would, uh, she'd like to fish all by herself, she would go out at night and uh, drag for shrimp and come back in and sell them and then have the day with her, uh, with her family. And um, about, about 20 years ago, as she was fishing, she started to notice all these changes happening, that there were uh, fewer and fewer shrimp, and then she would drag her nets and often bring up dead shrimp. Sometimes in the morning she'd come in from fishing and there'd be dead dolphins floating on the water in, uh, in the bay around sea drift, or there'd be these algae blooms, you know, black, green, and red algae blooms, and it was clear that the environment was getting sicker and sicker, and she even had to stop fishing. She took a job working for her brother in a fish house, and one day she's um, sitting in this fish house, and another fisherman comes in, and he gives her this little piece of paper. It was an article from another newspaper that said that uh, Calhoun County, Texas, where Sea Drift was, was the most polluted county in the whole United States. She'd also noticed that there was a lot of uh, an unusual degree of, of sickness in her community. I mean, a lot of childhood cancers, a lot of other people were having all kinds of various problems. And uh, 
she suddenly just got inflamed and she grabbed this article and she ran to the town office and said, look at this, we've got to do something about this. I mean, she was, she was a mother with five kids and she was really frightened for their welfare. And, uh, you know, the town father sort of patted her on the head and said, oh, Diane, calm down, nothing to get too excited about, it'll work out. And uh, nobody would listen to her, nobody. And uh, she was, you know, that didn't calm her down at all, it just made it worse for her. Uh, because she could see, because she was fishing and could see her own community, how bad this situation was. So she started being that lonely kook who, you know, marches with a sign up and down, up and down in front of places and says, uh, we got to do something about this. And everybody ignored her. And over a period of about 17 years, because that's how long her struggle was, and I mean, she's still very much of an activist on a whole variety of causes. But um, in this particular case, um, and it's, uh, she wrote a book uh, um, a couple years ago called An Unreasonable Woman, published by Chelsea Green. If you haven't seen this book, I really recommend it. She is one of the best, uh, sharpest, funniest, uh, compelling writers that um, I know of these days. Anyway, she tells a story in which she discovered over a long period of time that you know, out around Calhoun County were all these big manufacturing plants. There was Alcoa Aluminum, Union Carbide, Dow Chemical, Formosa Plastics, and a whole host of other ones. And what she discovered from informants inside the plant, I mean, workers that she knew, uh, who finally were willing to talk with her, told her that these companies were just straight piping all of their affluent, you know, all their toxic byproducts right into the Gulf of Mexico. And that she also eventually learned that what was happening was that uh, they had bribed not only the EPA, but all the local politicians so that they could get away with this just because they didn't want to spend the money to put in the um, you know, chemical, I mean, the, the pollution controls that would um, take care of the, this, uh, the stuff they were manufacturing. Um, she couldn't, you know, even went with all this information, she still couldn't get anything, anybody to listen. So she started doing more and more kind of outrageous things. I mean, she got in the process of, in, in the, during those 17 years, she got arrested 12 times. Uh, probably the most uh, interesting was when she hitchhiked into the Dow Chemical plant wearing a hard hat and then climbed two fences and climbed their big tower. You know, the big tower has the big dome and says Dow, you know. Chained herself to the top of the tower, dropped this big banner which said Dow Chemical is poisoning our children, and then the SWAT team came and the fire department and the police. Well, when she did things like that, people wrote about her finally. They fi she finally got her voice into the newspapers so that other people could hear what the issues were. It goes, you know, back in, the, in her own community, it turned out, of course, why her, um, you know, people told her to be quiet was that even though a lot of the families were all fishing families like her own, they all had uh, relatives who were working in these plants and they were terrified of speaking up and losing their jobs. 17 years, you know, innumerable court cases, Texas passes a zero discharge law. Not one drop of this stuff can go into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, during this period, she did other things like uh, she went out at night and sunk her own boat on top of one of the discharge pipes. She, um, uh, and, and people came after her. Um, they flew over a helicopter over her yard and shot her dogs. They, uh, she went out one night to fish and her boat started sinking. She's way out in the Gulf of Mexico at night by herself and her boat's going down. So she goes, and this is, I mean, you can take a look at her. You can tell what kind of woman she is. And um, so she goes down in the hold of her boat and it's full of water and she feels around until she finds, um, you know, where the uh, crankshaft goes through the back of the boat and through the stuffing box and somebody had pulled the stuffing and the boat was filling up that way. So she restuffed it. I don't remember, uh, you know, whether she took off her clothes and stuffed them in, whatever she did, you know, she stopped the, the leaking. And then she's thinking, gee, how come my pumps didn't come on? And she feels around and finds that somebody had cut the wires. So underwater, you know, at night, in the dark, she re-splices the wires and uh, gets the pumps working and saves herself. Um, anyway, read her story. It's a remarkable story. Uh, the time that she, one time she was in jail for four months in a women's jail and uh, um, as a result of seeing how women were treated in the jail, she started something called the, the Texas Jail Project to um, have, um, get better conditions for women who were put in, in prison. Um, 
this, you know, this, these issues around, which I'm going to come back to when I tell, talk a little bit about this man who's behind me right now, Perry Mann, um, about economy and environment and exploitation of resources and what we do to our own environment um, is, I think, you know, critical to, uh, you know, as big a question right now. Uh, in my own mind, you know, bigger than the economic crisis we're in. But I'll talk about that in a second. This woman, uh, Tilly Woodward, is, uh, lives in, or lived in a little town of Pella, Iowa. And uh, have you been in Pella, Iowa? Uh, she now teaches at Grinnell in, uh, in Iowa. But a few years ago, <coughs> when I was, oh, I don't know how many portraits I'd painted, but it was, the website was up and it was beginning to get a little attention. Uh, I got an email from a, some guy in Texas who said, oh, I see you're painting portraits. Um, do you know about Tilly Woodward and the portraits she paints? And I had never heard of Tilly Woodward, but I tried to learn something about her. And I was so impressed with what I was finding out that I got in touch with her and told her what I was doing and, you know, could I come and visit her in Iowa and meet her so I could paint her portrait. What she had done was, you know, like a lot of artists who are concerned about social issues, um, who find that they need to use their outrage about things, uh, make it into some kind of visible form to try to get other people to, you know, pay more attention. Um, she had, had done things like uh, painted pictures of, of children who were victims of war. And, you know, put these up and, you know, like so much sort of moralistic political art, people don't want to look at it. You know, it's just too gruesome. You know, it, uh, you, you turn away. And, I mean, unless you're already sort of active and concerned around those issues, you see those kinds of things, you say, oh, please, you know, I don't want to know. And she thought, you know, there's got to be another way to engage, um, you know, issues like this. So, um, something happened to her. Uh, in 1990 in Dubuque, Iowa, maybe some of you will remember this, uh, there were all of a sudden uh, this rampage of hate crimes. Uh, and there were these gangs of skinheads going through the city, beating up on, just attacking people of color, you know, diff ethnic, different eth ethnicities. And it got more and more out of control, and nobody seemed to be able to do anything about it. Uh, the local government, the police, weren't getting under control. And then the Ku Klux Klan came into Dubuque and burned some crosses. And, you know, it was more and more inflamed, the whole thing. And she was in Pella, Iowa, in her little studio there, thinking, you know, what can I do? What can I do? I've got to do something about this. And uh, finally she got this really simple idea. You know, some, some ideas, it's, it's as you know, simple and elegant to me as Rosa Parks sitting on a, you know, refusing to move off of a, um, in, in a, you know, a bus, or <coughs> um, Cindy Sheehan, you know, camping in a ditch outside of uh, uh, Bush's ranch in Crawford. She made up all these little, uh, just uh, what she called them nomination forms. They were just little slips of paper that said, Please tell me about somebody in your community who's done some, some good for the community, some act of kindness. And she took them and distributed thousands of them in, um, in Dubuque, in schools and in malls and churches and all over the place. And then they had her address on them and hundreds of them came back to her. And then she arranged to, to meet a lot of the people who'd been nominated. So she went to this church in, in um, Dubuque and the, the people came and she met them and talked to them and she picked 50 of them. And, um, you know, compared to her, I'm sort of a piker in terms of painting uh, portraits. In 50 days, she painted 50 portraits, big portraits, pastel stick portraits. And uh, she just had these very simple things on them. I mean, they just had the, the, this kind of stylized portrait. And then above it, it said the person's name. And below it, it's, it had a little legend just said, raked neighbor's leaves, loaned a car, brought in dinner, you know, little things like that. Um, and then she blew them up. And uh, I mean, these were children, they were all classes, ethnic backgrounds, everything, you know. It was, it was a cross section of Dubuque. And she put them on billboards all over Dubuque so that people in the city were looking up at themselves, magnified, and basically being asked the question, well, who do we want to be? You know, these violent racists full of hatred and fear at this moment and divided by it. Or do we want to be a community that's held together by little acts of kindness? 
it changed. The tone of the, of the community changed. Um, she was probably as amazed as anyone uh, that, you know, doing that kind of act would have that effect. She went on then to do several other things with, with uh, one with portraiture was, um, like in a lot of communities, it was considered, this, we're talking about the late 80s and 90s, and uh, anybody with AIDS was being punished by God. And uh, people wouldn't talk about it, and, and if, you were, if you had AIDS, you were, you know, <laughs> you know, you were less than human in some way, you know. And so uh, she wanted to do something about that, so she got identified to her uh, a lot of people who had HIV or AIDS, and she, she did portraits of them and then had them write on them their own words about what they had learned from having this disease, about themselves, about the disease, about their community, about what it means to be alive. And then she started showing them. And all of a sudden, you know, people were you know, paying attention to the humanity of these people. You know, they weren't just gay men, they were women, they were young people, they were older people. They were all kinds of people. And they were just like a lot of other people. And they even started traveling around and going to schools. You know, so that, uh, you know, that problem which enables so much of the injustice in society, in society of creating the other, you know, to which you can then do anything because they're not like you, um, is, uh, you know, so significant. And finding a way to get around that, to open people's hearts and eyes to the, the true humanity of, you know, their neighbors and what they're going through in their lives is just so uh, amazing. And, and, you know, how you can sort of trick your way to get people to look, you know, is wonderful. Um, she also did this great thing with, um, around issues of, of sexual violence towards women and girls. It was much more abstract and it was sculptural. She went into communities and put up these poles that looked kind of like uh, maypoles. You know, they, off the top of them they had all these beautiful ribbons of uh, purple, green, pink, red, all that sort of stuff. And um, what she would do is she would go to community and find out, um, again through a social service agency, you know, women and girls who had been intact. And then she would offer them the opportunity, if they wanted to uh, participate, to write their stories on these ribbons. And then put them on top of these poles and people would come up and think, oh wow, look, there's a, uh, some kind of celebration here. Oh look, there's something written on this. And then, oh my God, you know, and they would be thinking then, have their consciousness raised a little bit about what was going on in their own community. Um, she says, I'll just read you her quote here, I, I love it. Uh, she says, what moves me? Is it mission? It's permission. I start by giving myself permission, but what I really want ultimately is to give other people permission to value themselves. When you confirm goodness, you are taking an important step. When we confirm people's goodness over and over, we allow them to be that way. She's a very humble person, and uh, when she says that she gives herself permission, um, I would translate that in terms of a lot of these other people I've painted as having courage, you know, deciding to take a step of courage. Um, one of the people whose portrait is not here, uh, who was, I, I think, here uh, several years ago, was William Sloan Coffin, and I know Phil Sweet sitting there who was, uh, knew him well. Um, you know, just a remarkable man. And, you know, one of the things he said was that uh, without courage, there are no other virtues. You know, all, you think of all the things we admire. We think of, you know, compassion and love and generosity and all those, uh, those great virtues. Without courage, you know, without the, giving yourself permission to engage and get involved in an issue. You know, saying, you know, it may be happening to somebody else, but that doesn't mean it's not my issue. It is my issue. You know, and I've got to get involved with it if I am going to, you know, continue to have any self-respect. Um, that giving yourself permission, having that courage is, is uh, um, you know, the first very important step, you know, without which we don't have any of these other things. Um, let me talk a little bit about an issue that I've gotten very <coughs> involved with, and it has to do with um, this man here. When I was uh, right out of college in 1969, my wife and I went to uh, West Virginia to um, um, teach school in a little mountain school. We didn't, 
we, we didn't know where we were going exactly, except uh, um, my wife at that time had taken a course with Robert Coles, who was suggesting to some of us that had been involved in civil rights or anti-war stuff, he said, you know, why don't you go and work with uh, you know, these poor people in the mountains down there? Um, you know, there's all this stuff about civil rights going on, but there's some people there who um, need you as much as any other place in the country. And we thought, well, that would be very interesting. We'd read James Agee and, and um, seen the photographs and that kind of stuff and thought, okay, let's go do that. And we drove around for months, you know, trying to find jobs and finally got hired when there weren't enough teachers available in these little mountain schools. And I was in this county in southern West Virginia, I met Perry Mann. And he was one of the first people in my life who I thought was, he was a guy who was just living by his integrity. Uh, that he was, a, he'd been a school teacher, he was a lawyer, and he was incredibly and gently outspoken about his beliefs and uh, was a kind of uh, strangely admired person in his, in his community, even though he was, uh, in terms of issues and things, he was almost always opposite, um, you know, the going trends. But he spoke his, his uh, part and um, with great eloquence and compassion, and people listened to him, even though they frequently didn't agree with him. Um, a few years ago, uh, I heard about some of the things that were going on in southern West Virginia and eastern Kentucky and parts of Tennessee and Virginia. And I thought, I need to see this. Uh, and what's going on there um, is, um, I think, um, as important an issue as anything else that's going on in society now because of what it says about nature, what it says about economy, what it says about uh, a political system that allows things like this to happen. What I'm talking about is the manner in which coal is being mined today. You know, uh, over 50% of our electricity in this country comes from the burning of coal. Uh, where we get electricity without coal at this moment would be hard to say. It used to be that coal was always mined by underground miners, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the, um, you know, the history of, of coal mining in this country and people like Mother Jones, whose portrait was here last time, and her fight to get the, um, the workers to unionize, to uh, get out from under the burden of being basically slaves for the coal companies. Well, coal isn't mined that way much anymore. What they're doing is actually blowing up the mountains. Now, the Appalachian Mountains stretch from Quebec all the way to Alabama and are the oldest mountain range in the, whole, in the whole world, not just the United States, the whole world. They were formed when you know, the continent of what we call Africa bumped up against what we call North America, and in the collision, the mountains were forced up. And, and 300 million years ago, those mountains looked like the Rocky Mountains. And you know, through a great deal of time and, and uh, erosion and all that sort of stuff, they've been made into the beautiful sort of mountainous hills they are today, which are covered with the most productive forest in North America. The only um, more productive forest in our hemisphere is uh, the Amazon, the Amazon jungle. There are more species of plants and animals there than anywhere else in the country. And those forests absorb more carbon from the atmosphere than any other forests in the country. So in terms of, because this is all, all these issues sort of get tied together. And, and one of the other issues I'm really concerned about, as I'm sure all of you are, is climate change. But those forests there are, you know, like the lungs of the country. Well, what started happening in the mid-90s was that these, the coal companies realized that if they used uh, a lot of mechanization, built these enormous machines, and used a lot of explosives, they could uh, mine coal, if you call it mining, uh, a lot more cheaply than hiring people to dig under the ground to get it. And so what they did was uh, started just literally blowing up the mountains. I mean, the coal is in seams in a mountain. Uh, you know, some of them, the seams are only like this, you know, like, you know, 12 inches, 18 inches deep, sometimes 30 inches deep. And then down another 100 feet, there might be another coal seam. So what they do is, uh, well, first they shave the mountain, you know, just like preparing a, a patient for an operation. And they don't even harvest the forest. They dump the forest in the valley. 
and then they blow up the first top of the mountain and they dump the mountain, which they don't call a mountain anymore, they call it overburden. And then they call it valley fill. It keeps changing names as it slides down, you know, into the valley on top of the headwater streams and rivers that are down below. And they fill the valley with the mountain. And then they get to that first coal seam and they scrape it out with a huge machine called a drag line. And then they blow it up again and dump it again. Four million pounds of explosives every single day in this country to blow up the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains. This is more explosives than are used in Iraq and Afghanistan every single day. It's a resource war. The, um, there used to be, um, 50 years ago, nearly 200,000 underground miners in the Appalachians. There are now 15,000 workers running these giant machines and setting these explosives. The damage that is done to the environment is incalculable. 400,000 acres now are rubble and will never grow anything except this grass called lesbadiza, which is a Chinese grass which grows on rock. Um, that's what they plant when they're finished. Uh, you know, law says they're supposed to uh, reclaim the mountains, um, but they don't do that really. I mean, they, I mean, how can you do that? How can you reclaim a mountain, especially when you've dumped it in a valley? What they do is they make these um, you know, sort of rubbly, rubbly slopes and then plant this grass on them and then they import elk to run around on them to make them look like it's uh, something to do with nature. Uh, being in the presence of them and walking on them is like uh, trying to have a conversation with somebody who's been lobotomized. It's, it's, not, it's, it's like a virtual world. It's not nature at all. Um, over 500 mountains have been destroyed now. This issue, um, I mean, and, and then there's, I haven't even talked about the human cost because, you know, the, the communities all live in these valleys and around these mountains or on these mountains, and they are poor people. They are terrorized by these explosions and all the dust in the air and the chemicals that end up in their water. Their wells are destroyed by the explosions. Their houses are all cracked. Basically, the coal companies try to terrorize them so much and intimidate them that they leave, and then where do they go? Um, it's, it's, you know, and then not only the people, but then the culture. I mean, there are some, you know, as, as I'm sure a lot of you know, some wonderful indigenous sort of, you know, uh, eccentric cultures come out of those um, hollows in West Virginia and Kentucky. Um, this issue, um, I guess the thing that um, is so important to me about this is just the question of um, what is our reality? You know, we are taught in this country to believe that our reality is our economy. And of course, these last few weeks with the, you know, the economic crisis, the um, you know, controversy about the bailout and you know, $700 million here and, and, and you know, all the stuff that's going on with that, you know, we're, we're taught and, and conditioned and also made very fearful about what's going to happen as though the economy is our essential reality. Um, it, obviously, in a lot of ways, it has to do with our everyday reality in a very profound way. But on the other hand, there is something that is a lot more important than, um, you know, the economy. Our essential reality is nature. You know, we either live in harmony with nature or we don't live. And, you know, whatever the economy is, it's nature who is going to be making the final decision about whether we live here or not, or how we live. Uh, Perry Mann said, no lobbyist can bribe nature. In the end, all politicians and everyone else must accept the mandates of nature and the consequences of violating them. In that is my optimism. It's kind of a curious twist there at the end. Uh, you know, what he's saying is, or perhaps there's a, an interesting kind of, in the hardness of that statement, there's a kind of hope that we will see at some point that our, um, you know, and maybe it won't all be event-driven, but that, um, you know, we, we, we have to, you know, we, that will come clear to people that we have to live in, in harmony with nature uh, or we can't survive, and that will then wake us up. Uh, to live a different way. You know, what we're living, when we, when we blow up our own mountains so that we can have our lights on, 
you know that we're living in an unsustainable way. You know that we have become a, a, an economic society that is almost like a cannibal who finally eats himself. It's not uh, something that we, uh, you know, can, you know, obviously morally, but just realistically do and still um, continue to call ourselves any kind of a, a decent society. So, um, I've, I've, been, um, I've been there now many times, and in a couple of weeks I'll be in Louisville working with a group called Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, and I've painted um, now six or seven people uh, of, from West Virginia and Kentucky who are you know, fighting this fight to stop mountaintop removal. What's so sad is that in the last um, year, the price of coal has tripled, and there is absolutely no incentive to um, change this practice. Um, a few years ago, the Bush administration changed uh, one word in the EPA regulations about um, dumping mine waste. It used to be the EPA, the EPA said that if you dump toxic mine waste, which is what comes off of you know, the top of these mountains, when they're dumped like that, there's all kinds of uh, heavy metals and other uh, contaminants that's in that rock and, and soil that gets dumped down into those valleys and into the water. Um, it's, it's just terrible stuff. And the, the law said that, that uh, toxic mine waste could not be dumped in within 100 feet of a stream. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous to think it even could be that close, or that you could dump it at all. But anyway, that was the law. The Bush administration changed the word waste to fill, just that one word, which legalized all this behavior because fill can be dumped into a stream. Still the same stuff, but different word. There is now a bill before Congress um, to change the word back. And, and just uh, two weeks ago, I had a meeting with my congressman uh, in, from my area and uh, encouraged him to sign on as a um, co-sponsor of this, this bill. And he kind of just laughed about it. He said, this bill doesn't have a chance. He said, I agree with you. But he said, it's not going anywhere. Uh, you know, we're, you know, I guess one of the things that uh, so interests me about the, the, the mountaintop removal issue is that so many of the, the fights that have been fought, you know, about women's rights, civil rights, you know, things like that, um, they were long and they were dirty and, you know, people got killed and, and uh, you know, there was an enormous amount of, of pain and sacrifice, but we moved towards eventually a more sane and just and equal society. Uh, this one, it's hard to see right now how we're going to do that um, and whether any progress is going to happen. James Hansen, some of you must, I'm sure, know who James Hansen is. He's a NASA climate scientist. And uh, a few months ago, um, he was talking about the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. You know, they, they're saying that now that a, maybe a sustainable level is something about like 350 parts per million. Uh, we are now at something like 379 parts per million, and it's going up faster than it's ever gone in our history. In spite of the current awareness about climate change, it's going up faster and faster and faster. Um, he said that if we want to have any semblance of um, civilization as we know it continue on the Earth, we have to stop burning coal. I mean, it seems, I mean, how are we going to do that? I mean, you hear politicians today talking about clean coal technology. Um, there isn't such a thing. I mean, the, 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 the technology they're talking about has not been invented. There are ideas there about carbon sequestration and, and clean burning of coal that may or may not work. Some of them seem very dangerous to, to uh, you know, or impractical. But the other thing about them is if you talk to the people who live in these hollows in West Virginia, the idea of clean coal is outrageous because all they're talking about is maybe what happens at the end product. They're not even talking about the way it's mined and, what, and the destruction that's being done locally to the environment, uh, which is not just their environment. If you, there's a, a wonderful website called ilovemountains.com where you can, uh, .org, where you can go and type in your zip code and you can find out um, you know, where your electricity is coming from and how much is actually coming from mountaintop removal. And it'll even trace it all the way back to particular mines in Kentucky and West Virginia or Virginia and Tennessee 
which mountains were being taken down so that you can burn your lights. It's a rather uh, disturbing thing. I mean, uh, in New England, I thought um, that we were, our power grid didn't draw on coal burning much at all. So, but I went there and typed in my, my zip code, and it turns out there are two big coal burning plants, and there's a, a mine in eastern Kentucky which has um, been you know, taking down mountains in order for us to have electricity in New England. And I'm sure you would find the same thing here. It also allows you to go on that, uh, right from that website, to write a letter to those power companies, uh, a pre-written letter, you know, which is one of the wonders of the internet, and send it right then, you know, saying that this is, is not the way you'd like your electricity made. Um, but anyway, this is a, it's, it's, the ramifications of this issue are enormous but, and, and complicated, but if we're going to um, you know, actually change the way we're living, um, it's something we've all got to be thinking about. Some, I mean, these issues are so big, and, and uh, uh, you know, getting to some kind of um, sustainable future is actually going to be very difficult. But you know, not knowing what's really happening, you know, is uh, uh, is important. You know, one of the, I mean, is you know, it's very important. Now, what I'm going to say is uh, one of the, the big aspects I think of when I gave this title to this show, Americans Who Tell the Truth. Um, one of the things that I came obvious was that, you know, one of the most important things about truth-telling is that it, when you've got big problems, you know, whether they're with the economy or with nature or with uh, a war or with, uh, you know, whatever it is, unless you tell the absolute, you know, rock-bottom truth about it, there's no way you can solve it. There's no way you can fix it. There's no way you can come to terms with what needs to be done. You've got to face the seriousness of the problem. And um, so that's what I think all these folks have tried to do is, is you know, go right to that, the most serious aspect of the problem, face what it really is, and then use their courage and persistence to try to do something about it. And when I'm talking, I'm going to just end in just one second. But when I talk to kids now, what I try to say to them is that these are not, and I don't want them to see these people, whether they're you know, from 150 years ago or you know, living today, as historical figures. You know, these are role models for all of us about how to live a life that engages the serious issues of our time. You know, these aren't people sacrificing their lives to uh, make lives of other people better. They're people fulfilling their lives by coming to terms with their own morality, their own idealism, and uh, becoming better for it and asking all of us, you know, to join in with them. But anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and I would love to have some questions or comments or um, conversation about uh, all this. Thank you very much. Something. <laughs> yes. Uh, these people have a particular point of view that has been aggravated, aggravated over a period of time. Is a certain anger in them, frustration, the whole composite. You're drawing pictures of them. How deeply do you go into their emotional state when you do draw? Thinking of kind of like the psychological relationship between their angst and yours. And, and how you've related in the past? How, how is that? Well, that's interesting. There's certainly, I use them. <laughs> I mean, that may not sound right, but it, it is. I mean, I certainly use them for a, a mirror for a lot of my own feelings. But I'm not being, I'm, I'm also trying to honor their own. But I, you know, a minute ago I quoted William Sloan Coffin. Um, there certainly is anger and outrage in everybody, and I think that's, extremely important. I mean, if you don't, I mean, if you see a great injustice happening and you don't feel that, there's something wrong. It's how you use it. And I think the thing that drives them, though, is not the anger or the outrage or the angst, it's the compassion. And that's what I'm trying to, um, I think, show you, even though some of the words are very tough. You know, um, William Sloan Coffin said, um, let me get this right here. If you lessen your anger at the structures of power, you lower your love for the victims of power. And uh, I think what drives these people is their love for the victims. 
and you know one of the great sources of energy for that you know how they go on is their anger but I don't you know I, I want to try to show their toughness but really I'm interested in particularly in, in the degree to which they um, will use their compassion to fight for a better world you know. does that answer that yeah, yeah. Of the cause and the effect, flipping the cause to a different cause. Well, absolutely, but it, um, you know, a lot of times these days you, you, you talk about being angry about somebody and something, and somebody says, "Oh, you ought to see a therapist." You know, you're going to get over that. And uh, well, there, there, sure, there's a, there is a good way to get over it, and that's to act with compassion to fix it. You know, and uh, rather than see a therapist. Um, Another thing Coffin said, I'm always quoting Coffin, I mean, he, he was like William, like um, Martin Luther King. He knew how to, you know, put a particular, in, in, in extremely articulate language, identify uh, a moral problem. And another thing he said all the time was, uh, improve the quality of your suffering. You know, don't suffer for yourself. You know, go out and work for, for somebody else's suffering and you will take care of two at the same time, you know, your own and theirs. Uh, possibly, anyway. So, um, uh, that's what it's, uh, you know, about for me today. Although, it's interesting, I mean, in terms of anger, I mean, there's Medea Benjamin over there, and there are a few that have these great big smiles, and, and uh, I was, you know, talking to her about painting a portrait, and she said, well, you know, they can take away everything, but they're not going to take away my joy. I said, she said, I want to be painted smiling. You know? <laughs> Uh, yeah, Deborah. Could you talk a little bit more about that intersection between how you wanted to paint people and how they wanted to be portrayed? And uh, tell them the story about Pete Seeger and his hat, his wife, or anything else that oh, yeah, well, strikes you? What's interesting is, um, you know, every one of these pictures has as much of a story as Tilly's or Diane's or Perry's or anybody. They they all have these wonderful stories, and and uh, they all ha also had a at least the living people had an interesting intersection uh, with me about uh, doing the portrait. Um, most of them, you know, when I would approach them about doing it, I'd say, oh, no, no, not me, uh, you know, anybody but me. Uh, when I went out recently to Minneapolis to paint uh, Colleen Rowley, um, you know, she was the FBI agent who uh, blew the whistle on the fact that the FBI uh, knew a lot more, or could have known a lot more about 9-11, and uh, she did, in fact, and was trying to get warrants to investigate some of the hijackers beforehand because they had identified some of them and was refused again and again you know she wasn't here's the FBI would not you know uh, investigate these people and they could have she's convinced they could have stopped it anyway uh, so I, I show up to paint Colleen Rowley and she gives me a list of eight people she said you can paint me but you got to paint these other people first <laughs> um, I said okay I came all the way out here Colleen you know uh, anyway I've painted her portrait. Uh, you can see it on the website. Um, Pete Seeger wanted to be painted with his wife, uh, Toshi, who said, you know, I couldn't have done anything I've done without her. And, um, well, that was an interesting standoff there. I, um, I mean, I, I really wasn't resistant to that too much, but I really wanted to paint him um, because he was the public face, at, at least, of them. And so, uh, but he, uh, Toshi had made him that red cap, and so we, we put Toshi's hat on his head, and uh, so her presence is there. Um, some people have been uh, have uh, been very um, interested in, in just well, a lot of people, you know, they just kind of look at me and say, "Okay, do it," and uh, and I tell them how I want them to look at me while I'm painting it. But um, other times, people are say, you know, I want to pa be painted really fierce. You know, I mean, when I painted Jody Williams, the Nobel Peace Prize winner for her, uh, the international campaign against landmines, um, she said, I want to look angry. <laughs> Speaking of anger. <laughs> and then two years later, she changed her mind. I mean, the portrait was done. I got this email from her. So she, she asked me if I'd do it again. I oh, no. <laughs> um, I didn't do it again. But uh, anyway, <laughs> yes. How long does it take you to complete a portrait? Well, the painting itself takes about a week, usually, uh, plus or minus, depending on how cooperative the subject is in looking like himself or herself, but um, uh, the process of each one is a whole lot longer. I try to, you know, if, if they're writers, I try to read 
as much as I can of what they've written, uh, interviews, speeches, all that kind of stuff, looking for just the thing that I want to put on their picture. And then a lot of times there's a lot of give and take between me and the, and the person about what the quote will be. I mean, I'll choose something and say, you know, I'll send it to them and say, how about this? Or I found a sentence here and another sentence there and say, can I put these two things together and could you say it in a different way or something like that. Um, Bill McKibben, I mean, he's known primarily as a great um, environmentalist of this day. And, um, you know, he wrote the book, The End of Nature, where that, he's one of the first people I read who started really talking about encouraging people to, to think about what, that a, what is our essential reality? Is it economy or nature? And, uh, you know, he does all this great stuff, but he wrote this article in Harper's about um, religion. And uh, he's a very religious person himself and draws a lot of his energy and strength from it. And um, he felt that religion was being just misused terribly today by a number of our leaders. And so he, I took that quote from that article in Harper's and sent it to him and said, do you mind if I use that instead of something from about uh, the environment. And he said, oh, sure. Yeah. He thought that was good. Have any of your subjects self-nominated themselves? <laughs> uh, not anybody got paid. I mean, <laughs> I have, I have, uh, I've had several self-nominations. And several people, I think, talk to me kind of without saying that. But um, no, most of the people are much more um, reluctant in a way. I mean. Have you had any typos? Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Several paintings had to be completely redone because I, you know, I get so, in, these are, when the paintings dry, I take a steel needle and scratch into it. And I'm so intent on scratching each letter, it's actually kind of hard. And um, to the, this is, a, they're on wooden panels, to the wood underneath that's got this uh, uh, three layers of gesso on it. To, that's what's white that shows through. And um, some of them, I, I do it frequently, misspell it. Sometimes I catch it myself. Uh, often my wife catches it, you know, I'll say, oh, look, it's a great new portrait. She says, oh, you've spelled democracy without an M again. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But I, the, the, there's a painting of, uh, which is in the book, of um, James Baldwin, which I did that three times. The and, portrait? No, no, well, I, you know, I misspelled three times. I mean, once I had the same word at the end of the line that I had at the beginning of the next line, read through it, you know, a hundred times myself, didn't see it, and then I fixed it, and then started misspelling words all over the place. And uh, she caught it each time, and finally had to, I mean, it used, if you look at the portrait, you'll see that it's, the bottom color is different than the top. It's painted in sort of bands of color. I could never match this color again. And then I painted this kind of, it looks almost like a, a dried blood flag or something. It's, uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's humbling. Yes. I was sort of wondering the trajectory of this for you. Like, did you start with sort of well-known people saying things that you might expect them to say, or like some people like say things we don't expect them to say, or people we never heard of. I mean, where where do you see that going as you've chosen people? I mean, there are some people that are obviously missing that we know about, and I mean, you're showing us people that many of us don't know. About. Well, I I have painted. It started with especially a lot of well-known people. Um, you know, I painted. Um, you know, like starting with Walt Whitman and then Frederick Douglass, uh, Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you know, up through W.B. Du Bois, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, you know, all these sort of people like that. And then, of course, when you start painting contemporary people, they're a lot less well-known and many of them very controversial. Um, but, of course, if you were living in the time of Susan B. Anthony, she would be just as controversial. Um, and was, you know, we look back at people like that today um, whether it's, you know, someone like, you know, Susan B. Anthony or Rosa Parks and think of them as, you know, great heroes of our country. And at their time, I mean, you know, remember that Rosa Parks had to move to Detroit to get away from the death threats and that people all over the country hated her, literally hated her. I remember growing up in Ohio and being told, oh yeah, the only reason she didn't move was because she's so tired from working and, you know, she's just causing trouble and, you know, my own family was saying things like that. I mean, people hated her. Uh, People always hate the people who are upsetting the status quo, you know? And um, so, um, but what, you know, I, so I try to have a mix of well-known and less well-known people. And, um, and just because I am so excited when I discover, you know, someone like Tilly Woodward, you know, doing her thing in Iowa, and then get to tell her story, 
um, because I find it extremely inspirational um, to um, introduce you know people like that to other people. And then I you know the the the, the thing about the quotes though is really interesting because I try to find quotes whether they're from somebody 150 years ago or last week that are like little punches you know to our thinking about where we are today and um, you know I, I get to go into schools and talk to kids and if I were saying some of the things myself I mean directly I would never get invited to into a school I would never be allowed to say these things uh, but if I can say Wendell Berry said or Marion Wright Edelman said I mean Wendell Berry the quote I put on his painting came from an essay he wrote in 1991 at the end of the first Gulf War and he, and he said the most alarming sign of the state of our society now is, is, is that our leaders have the courage to sacrifice the lives of young people in war but not the courage to tell us to be less greedy and less wasteful I mean wow and I you know I, I say that to I say kids this is what Wendell said what do you think what does that mean kids get it I mean uh, Marion Wright Edelman said, uh, um, somebody's got a book there, I can, it's like on the first page. Uh, she said, uh, what's, um, what's the, what is it, how does it start out? Oh, it's right there. One second. I'm just gonna, oh, what's wrong with our children? She asked. This is, it comes from a, actually, she's a, besides, you know, Marion Wright Edelman is the uh, head of the Children's Defense Fund, has been lobbying for better lives for poor kids all over this country for years and years and uh, she said this comes from a prayer that she wrote She says what's wrong with our children it's adults telling children to be honest while lying and cheating it's adults telling children not to be violent while marketing and glorifying violence I believe adult hypocrisy is the biggest problem that children face in America so you know you present that to a bunch of high school kids and you say what do you think about that kids and they all, you know, I've never met a bunch of kids who didn't say, yeah, whatever, that's right. You know, you know it's like, okay, that's just the way it is. And then I, what I want to know then from them is to get them to, to go a step further and think, okay, now wait a minute. Why would an adult society do that to its own children? You know, why would it play with them that way? Why would it tell them to be honest while they're actually is presenting them and asking them to live in a dishonest society about a lot of the most important questions or why would it ask them you know say nonviolence while it's actually encouraging them to be titillated by violence to think that violence is the way you solve problems and present in its media you know thousands of images every single day of titillating violence and violence solving problems when some other method could be used so you know it's that's the use of these is, is uh, profound and also um, you know, so many of the people of, um, who are actually lionized in the society are simultaneously, I think, castrated. I mean, if you think of uh, every year when we, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, celebrate, you know, Martin Luther King. And uh, I love to talk to kids about King because everybody knows I have a dream, which is a, you know, wonderful speech and it makes you feel really good when you read it. But it's nowhere near um, his real beliefs about how the society was run, why it was run the way it was, what racism really meant, what materialism really what meant, what imperialism was all about, how those things were all connected. And I mean, if you read his speech that he gave in 1967 in, in, uh, on April 4th, the year to the day before he was assassinated in Riverside Church when he came out against the Vietnam War, I mean, that's one of the greatest speeches ever given in America. Nobody ever mentions it. You know, and what I try to do is go to those points where you know, these people we call great Americans and truth tellers were actually saying the thing that was the most true that we really have to get to. And people like Mark Twain, well, we all know Huck Finn, but we do, do we read his war prayer? You know, where he starts talking about, you know, well, what does it mean when you say, um, you know, God is on our side when you're fighting a war. And he starts just listing the atrocious things that happen in a war. The, you know, the, 
dismembered children and the blown up women and the, you know all these and he just starts you know in very graphic detail he starts going through these things and then he keeps saying well God is on our side you know it's uh, this isn't the quote I used on his picture but uh, you know that's where their truth is is in you know some of that really sharp and uh, incisive language that really talks about what really runs a, a society yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah. A lot of the stuff you said is people don't believe you. <laughs> well, if you read his letters, Eisenhower hated war. You know, he came out of the Second World War just appalled at not only the damage done and and uh, to human beings, but to society and to places and and the waste of of uh, of money. But of course, he said that after the Korean War, uh, right in 1953. And by the way, there's a um, Speaking of Eisenhower, there's a, um, an amazing documentary that was made a few years ago, two years ago, I think, called Why We Fight, which begins with Eisenhower in black and white giving his military-industrial complex speech, you know, in 1961 as he was leaving office. See that documentary. I mean, I was, just, you know, I was a kid then, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I ever saw it then, but seeing it now and seeing the passion with which he's the stridency with which he's delivering those words, the fear that he has for uh, how we're losing our democracy to, you know, this what, you know, in his, um, in his first draft of the speech, it said military industrial congressional complex, and his aides said, you better take that out. <laughs> but uh, I would say military industrial congressional media complex today. But anyway, uh, um, yeah, I, I look for things like that. There are a lot of people who are, actually quite upset. I think that the, the Eisenhower presence in this show is a, a lightning rod for some people who you know, know a lot about his um, administration and the overthrow of the Mossadegh democracy in Iran. I mean, think, you know, here we are establishing you know, democracy in the Mideast. I mean, here they had a democracy, a, you know, a real democracy in Iran in 1953, and you know, uh, Kermit Roosevelt and the CIA went in there and, and uh, overthrew it. Next year, we did the same thing in Guatemala to the Arbenz government. This is all under Eisenhower. And I, I have a friend who has a, who's an Iranian who, when she saw that there was Eisenhower there, she said, oh, she, just, she was really angry. And I said, well, none of these people is a saint. You know, and they are, that, that's one of the real points about this. They've all got, you know, they're all real people who've made mistakes. And, and I, you know, I wouldn't uh, trust everything they did any time to say everything they did was the truth. You know, as, I'm defining it here, but you know about certain issues or uh, some of them more, some of them less. You know they did and said uh, and, and followed up with some kind of action. Uh, their words on in really important things. Yeah. There's, there's something with the eyes. There's something with the eyes in all of these portraits. It's like it makes what was said that you etched in seems to be more powerful. Was that a common thread with the people that you met? that their eyes just seem to project their soul more, or is that something that you sort of focus on? Well, it's certainly something that I focus on, and I think is there in every person that I painted. I mean, when I'm looking at them to, I mean, I, they don't all pose for me for a couple weeks. You know, I, I take pictures and stuff. Um, I ask them to look at me um, with, with a feeling of their compassion, integrity, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, and then when I'm painting them, I, I, I kind of rough in their face a little bit, and then I paint their eyes until I feel that there's a real person right there. And uh, I was describing earlier, I think to Steve, you know, uh, that part of the process here is actually, it's almost like falling in love with each person. I mean, you know, that happens through your eyes. And I try to get that connection uh, to give a sense that this person is really there. Uh, looking right at you and, well, and when I'm painting, having a conversation with me. Um, I mean, you know, there's an awful lot of um, portraiture, which is kind of, um, uh, you know, misses that, I think, in the eyes, you know, and, and uh, I try to get that, and certainly uh, this gentleman here, Jim, has painted uh, these, these portraits, some of the portraits that are here of uh, Gerhard Miller and stuff like that. I mean, he certainly gets that in, in his eyes. I was admiring his portraits earlier. They're, they're terrific. Um, but anyway, that's that's the connection. You know, is, is getting that look. You know.
Do you have a question back? I just, um, I like the title, Americans Who Tell the Truth. Um, I think that the quotes show a variety of truths that come forward because there is no single truth. I commend you for doing that. And I encourage you to challenge everybody to whom you speak, those in the room, me, to tell the truth, to be uncomfortable with where the truth may be leading, with, leading you, but to find that place in each of us. Because to me, this is what's unique about being an American is the search for the truth is an individual search and all of us together reach a truth that none of us individually can find. So please challenge people to be uncomfortable with the truth in their own lives to search for it. Thank you. That's wonderful. I, I, it certainly makes me very uncomfortable often uh, knowing how, where the truth leads and, and all the compromises that are in my own life. Uh, that I'm not, you know, um, doing everything I could or living a way that, you know, when I haven't turned off a light when I've left a room or, you know, written my congressman about an issue that's upset me, you know. Um, there are lots of things, you know, on all different levels that uh, we need to feel uncomfortable about. And, and I think you're right about that. And I think also that sort of commonality of truth seekers uh, is very important. I mean, one of the things that I think is happening to all of us, uh, whether we're, how much, you can see it happening very consciously all over the country in a lot of areas, is this awareness that we need to be concentrating much more on uh, the health of our local communities, that we have to be living amongst each other and with each other for each other, uh, and that that's where our strength for the future is going to come, not expecting, you know, uh, Henry Paulson to save us, but our neighbors and our friends to be um, with us together in handling problems around food and energy and transportation and education and all those things. That's where our greatest strength is going to come, you know, communities of you know, people getting together and saying, well, what is the truth now in terms of, I mean, that's sort of a heavy word, but, you know, how are we going to live? You know, how do we choose to live? Uh, there's a, um, I, I know I'm talking too long, but I just want to say this one thing. The, the University of Southern Maine in, um, in my state is has rewritten, I've had two big shows of the portraits there and they're rewriting their uh, curriculum for their college around the ideas that are, that are in these portraits and they, they call it, how then shall we live? And to me that's, that's the questions that are asked there and of course when you start asking that question you do come up, up against a lot of uncomfortable things and uh, no one, you know, is, is um, you know, totally clean in the way we live or, you know, or can we expect to be. But we all need to be, you know, living together and moving together and forgiving together and trying to get to some sustainable and, and uh, uh, sound community place together. With folks like Du Bois, hmm. W.D. Bois can help move that forward. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. I just want to say that I hope you'll have a very long life in this very meaningful and provocative um, life's work that you have begun. I, I've really never seen or heard anything quite like this body of work. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank well, thank you. you. you know, this, it's interesting. This, this is all out there. I mean, people are doing these things and saying these things, and our media tells us about Britney Spears, you know? And um, that's what's so, one of the things that's so disturbing, is that, um, you know, what we need to be hearing and need to be given as, a, as models for behavior is being not given to us. You know, we're, we're starved for this stuff. I mean, when, when Anne Wright, whose portrait's over there, you know, you know, she was one of three diplomats who quit the uh, Foreign Service the day the war started in Iraq. And an amazing statement. And she's been now a full-time activist ever since. And, um, you know, I think her name appeared once in the major media, you know, that day. Or, you know, and then was gone. You know, and uh, she's, she's a remarkable person. I just one love her. One of the beauties of the project is not, in addition to the aesthetic beauty, is the awareness factor. And I think that's a great contribution. Mm -hmm.
Uh, if any other questions, otherwise we can uh, have some punch and eat some cookies, and uh, I'll sign a few books if anybody's got one for me to. Anyway, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here.